Hello everybody and welcome back to another Teach Astronomy stream. My name is Victoria, uh, but you guys can call me Vicky, and I'm here with Matthew over here. And, Hello everyone. And we have our special guest today, Martin Radcliffe. Hi everybody. So uh, Matthew, you guys are uh, good friends, so I guess I could let you introduce uh, Martin. Absolutely, I'd love to. Uh, so Martin and I have known each other now for probably 10 years, and I met him while I was a graduate student at the University of Arizona doing astronomy education. And uh, Martin's originally from England, and he's been an amateur astronomer for, um, I don't know, five-ish five decades, something Ish. like that. <laughs> and um, uh, That's right. And you, uh, So he teaches astronomy at Wichita State University, uh, was the planetarium director at the Exploration Place, which is a science center in Kansas, in Wichita, and uh, he worked at Skyscan, which is a planetarium company, um, and he trained planetarium staff all over the world. I believe you had some involvement with a Beijing planetarium, as I remember? Yes, Beijing, Hong Kong, uh, Buenos Aires, um, South Africa, Cape Town, yeah, you name it, we've been there. That's so <laughs> yeah. cool. And uh, he's a former president of the International Planetarium Society, and he's written the monthly column Night Sky for the astronomy or for astronomy magazine for the past 24 years. So I mean, that's just a quick, <laughs> that's awesome. That's so exciting. Yeah. And uh, astronomy magazine is still just do, going strong and has a good presence. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's a, it's one of the you know, very popular astronomy magazines. You can get it on the newsstand. And um, yeah, I've, Subscribe. I subscribed to it when I was in England from about the nineteen mid nineteen seventies, and um, and it's amazing. In fact, uh, one of the first editors I read there was my editor when I did really? the call, and he just retired. So, oh, wow. yeah, it's a small family. That is amazing. That's awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. We appreciate it. We've sort of teased our audience a little bit about astrophotography, and I've. Um, sort of, I, I have a a couple of uh, telescopes that I really originally bought for um, to do solar projection and solar observing, and have you know tried to do a little bit of like iPhone astrophotography with yeah. very little success. So we are excited to have somebody here with an actual track record. <laughs> I've made many mistakes, so that's what helps. Okay, <laughs> excellent. There's no, no failures in life. There's learning experiences, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Well, I've had plenty of those. <laughs> Me too. Especially with astrophotography recently. Yeah. Um, so it's can gone. you just tell us a little bit about how your interest in astronomy began? And uh, when would you say you first became an amateur astronomer? So that's a, a good intro, actually, into the photography side as well, because... Um, I first became interested in astronomy during the Apollo uh, moon landing program. Um, I was not very much aware of uh, anything before Apollo 8, and Apollo 8 was the first spacecraft to leave Earth and go around the moon. It didn't land. Um, that absolutely captivated my imagination, um, and, and most kids of <laughs> that era in the late 1960s. Uh, it was uh, just stunning to watch. Uh, this was pre-internet, pre-computers, well, pre any of the computers we have today. Um, I think the, the memory of the Apollo computer was something like 8K or 16K. Uh, it's just phenomenal what, what they did with that. And uh, then I became very interested in astronomy. I got a couple of small telescopes. Um, my first telescope was um, cost about $9 and uh, was awful. Um, <laughs> It, and I pulled it apart to see if I could get it working better, and it didn't. <laughs> uh, but I learned uh, some things there. I, um, you know, I learned that if you put too many pieces of glass in a telescope tube, it's not going to work very well. And that that was a cheap one. So uh, it took me a very, very long time to learn. Um, long time to learn that uh, the the better quality optics will give you better results and they're more expensive and that's just um the way things are but that is not to say that you can't do things with a, with a reasonable budget which so you can uh and i'm going to talk about doing things with an iphone but my dad had an old film camera 
uh, which I and I had a telescope, and so I would strap the camera on the piggyback on the telescope with elast rubber bands and pieces of tape and all sorts of stuff. And I would look through the eyepiece of the telescope and track the sky while the camera was shooting to try and get long exposures because wow. the sky was moving. Uh, we didn't have these modern gizmos that I have behind me, which make it so simple. Um, that, well, relatively simple compared to those days. Mm -hmm. uh, so I tried my old style of photography and I still have the prints uh, that I took. In fact, just as we were doing the preamble, um, have on my shelf here my original notebook in which I wrote down um, an astronomical photography record book 1977 oh to God. 1983 uh, where I wrote down every shot that I took. Oh wow that's amazing. That's, so cool. that's how you learn right because you go now what did I do last week with that exposure how long was it how big was the aperture what Condi what were the conditions like? And then gradually, as you write that down, you learn and you start, you know, figuring things out. Nowadays, I don't write it down because the metadata is on the photograph, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's all there. It's all recorded. Um, it, it's uh, it, it's crazy in that way. So that's how I began photography, and I was I joined an astronomy club, which was really the trigger to me learning more because there were experienced photographers there and I would listen to their talks and I thought how do they do that that's just incredible and nowadays we've got tools like Photoshop and Deep Sky Stacker which I'll talk about um, uh, later on and and uh, it's just some of the tools today are, make it so much easier to get into it and get some decent results. That's really interesting. Um, you said something there, and uh, we have kind of a, a worldwide audience, and especially in these days where you've got um, a lot of people um, are not able to go to these, you know, meetings of astronomy clubs. Are, are, do you are you do you participate in? Are you familiar with any online um, communities where uh, folks could go to learn more about this? Do you know of anything? Yes. There are a couple of uh, really good sites. Um, <clears throat> one general large community that's been going ever since the internet started, I think, pretty much. So it, it's one of the very, very early chat room type things. It's called Cloudy Nights. Uh, it's actually run by a company in Oklahoma, um, but it's a free, you can just log on for free. And there are people on there all the time answering questions. Um, and particularly if you're beginning, uh, starting out, um, you know, astronomy club people, generally 99% of them are extremely helpful and will help a beginner, um, uh, you know, with some really good helpful advice. Um, the other one, uh, and I have used this a lot, it's a, uh, for photography at least, astrophotography is called Astro Backyard. Um, if you, you can find Astro Backyard on um, YouTube. Uh, it's run by a guy in Canada called Trevor Jones. Uh, he's an extremely clear, lucid, uh, very good uh, introductory ideas, uh, some advanced ideas as well. Um, but he has some basic intro uh, videos as well as some more advanced techniques. And uh, people will find that very, very useful, I think. That's awesome. Um, one of our uh, participants, Alexandra, would like to know if you could talk about some of the things that you've uh, you've observed and photographed, like what are some of your favorite things oh, that you have my, ever yeah. seen, and what your what are your current? That's a great question. Thank you for that, Alexander. Um, so, so there's a lot in astronomy that stays there: uh, the constellations, the Milky Way. Um, I enjoy taking photographs of those. Um, and in fact, Vicky, if you can mm -hmm. share. Um, one of those slides of that I sent you. It is number, which one is it? Number 14. 14. All right. I'll put that. Um, oh, that's beautiful. This is, this is a photograph of the Milky Way. Now, one of the advantages I had of traveling around the world training people is that I would take my camera with me. And so when I was in South Africa, um, actually, this was a personal trip to South Africa where I went. <laughs> individually to, to see Mars in 2018. It was best from the Southern Hemisphere. It was the closest ever, uh, or one of the closest ever. 
and it won't be that close for 20 years, by which time I'll be uh, you know, retired and enjoying armchair astronomy, probably. <laughs> um, but I, I, uh, I took a photograph of the Milky Way with a wide-angle lens and, um, and then processed it through uh, Photoshop, and it's one of my favorite things to do is photograph the Milky Way. Uh, the other thing you could do with astronomical photography is take photographs of uh, foreground interesting features that are silhouetted against the night sky. And that's really, um, it's an area of astronomy, astrophotography called nightscapes, and they're wonderful to try and do, especially in late sunset. Um, you have that beautiful deep blue sky with an orange horizon and maybe a few trees silhouetted against it. That's really beautiful. Um, we have an event coming up, and these are one of the things I like uh, capturing, uh, and that is when there's a couple of planets nearby or the moon nearby the planet. So uh, a new moon, uh, let's see, will be near Jupiter and Saturn, I think, uh, later next week, so look out for that. But on the 21st of December, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be their closest in like 400 or 800 years, depending on which particular caveat you want to isolate. Um, but uh, they'll be both visible in telescopes. Getting a photograph of that is wonderful. Um, other things I enjoy photographing, um, one thing I did a few months ago, remember when SpaceX launched their first two astronauts up to the space station? Uh, on that evening, uh, the space station was flying over Wichita. And so I like taking my camera just on a tripod like this, uh, this one. Um, so I'll let's just set it on a tripod and I pointed it at where the space station was going to cross and I opened the shutter for 20 seconds. And um, I could not see SpaceX. Uh, it was too faint. But I grabbed my binoculars and I could see it. I could see SpaceX following the space station. So I moved the camera quickly and took a longer exposure and I got a beautiful shot of the space station going into sunset. So it turned orange, right? Oh, that's so cool. And the space, SpaceX following it. And so I love posting that kind of thing on Facebook because it's an isolated, unique shot that you can't recreate, very rarely recreate. So that's mm -hmm. fun. I also enjoy photographing total eclipses of the sun. I've done that a lot. Um, and uh, again, that's something you have to practice and, and get experienced at. And Typically, a solar eclipse lasts two minutes, and if you miss the shot, you, you're done. Yeah. Uh, it's very intense, <laughs> very exciting. A lot of people recommend if there's a solar eclipse, just sit back and enjoy it. Um, because the intensity around photography will take your mind away from, from the eclipse experience a little bit. Unless yeah. you're crazy, yeah. crazy like me, and you have to photograph it. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> I've been there when the, during the last eclipse, <clears throat> we visited my brother's house and it was, it's like you, you sort of lose yourself in the minute, in the moment. And <clears throat> there was a, a guy on YouTube that I watch who tried to f photograph it. And <clears throat> he, I can't, I think he maybe forgot to take the lens cap off his camera cause he was so caught up in it. Or, I mean, there was, there was some thing that happened and yeah. <clears throat> You know. I mean, there's so much pressure, right? You have that like one that one moment, especially like even with the um, the one where you're saying with SpaceX and going across the sun. Um, I've done very little astrophotography for as much as I've worked on the you know astronomy stuff. But uh, mm -hmm. one of the things I did do is we tried to catch uh, the ISS transiting the sun for a video, oh, and we caught it barely, uh -huh. but like. Oh my gosh, it was like so we drove like three hours um, yep. up uh, Mount Lemon in Tucson to get it. Well, it was like an hour and a half, I guess, but um, <laughs> it was like all this pressure and it was only for like half a second. Um, yes. But yeah, it's so rewarding when you get it, you know. Well, they're the exciting events when you have to really make an effort to get to it and then you capture it. Uh, it's tremendously rewarding, uh, just personally rewarding. And then uh, what I've always found is if you show somebody a photograph, um, particularly who's not involved in astronomy, uh, generally their reaction is something related to, you took that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did you take that? And you get a of questions, which is why people are signed in today, right? Mm -hmm. To listen to streaming. How do, you, How do you do that? And, and actually, 
you know, the principles, maybe we should talk about some of the principles of yeah. the photography because you can do yeah, it. You can do it with a cell phone. Um, the one key thing about astrophotography is you, your camera has to be absolutely still. Uh, if you're taking a picture and your camera moves, you've got all of these horrible shaky stars and it looks horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you have to mount your camera or whatever iPhone on a stable platform, preferably a tripod. So you can kind of find one of those grip things and to hold it. The other thing with, I know particularly with my iPhone, and I'm sure it works with an Android, is uh, the speaker, the uh, headphone cable has a volume button on it. And actually, Matthew, I can see yours to your mm -hmm. right, maybe your yep. left. Yeah, that one right there. That's a shutter release. Is it really? Well, yes. Not many people know that. Oh I just got to I didn't know that. So you don't have to touch the phone to take a picture. You plug that in and you use the the volume button to take photos. I had no I idea. certainly didn't know that until this very moment. Today I learned, right? Yeah. It, <laughs> That's crazy. I was this this was, many years old. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'd had an iPhone for years before I knew that. I went, oh, that changes the world. Yeah. And so what you can do, now the other thing is uh, to take good photographs, let's say, of the Milky Way or constellations, um, is to stack the images because uh, every photograph you take has background noise. It's just electronic noise. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. every photograph you take also has the signal. And one of the tricks is that as you take a photo, if you double it, the, the photographs of the stars double in intensity, but the background only uh, goes by, uh, increases by one and a half. So if you take four shots, you get four times the image strength, but only two times the background noise. If you take nine shots, you get three times the background noise, but nine times the intensity. So you see, as you stack, you get better and better and better. Mm -hmm. So the idea with an iPhone and the Milky Way is at night, take, let's say, 100 photos. So you'll have 100 times the signal, only 10 times the background noise. And then you put that into a software called Deep Sky Stacker, which is a free software. Uh, you just look up Deep Sky Stacker, download it, and it'll say load files. And you load your files, don't worry about all the other stuff, and stack it. And let's see what happens, see what comes out, and just play with it. And that costs you nothing because most people have a phone of some kind with a lens on it. And you can just experiment. And that's a great way to start experimenting. And the key to getting into astrophotography is experiment with simple stuff that you already have first before you start spending money on stuff like this. <clears throat> because this starts getting serious. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, I'll tell you one of the, uh, and here's another clue. Uh, this, I like sharing this little clue. Here's a lens that I dearly wanted to buy for about three years. Literally, three years. You have the size of the glass. Oh, that's nice. So that's what that Milky Way shot that we just showed you was taken with in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, this camera fell off the tripod and cracked the uh, edge. Ooh. But the lens was okay. Oh, thank yeah. God. Yeah, at this very moment. It was actually on that night I took the Milky Way shot. Yeah. Ah. Um, and this lens is a very high quality optical quality. Um, so it costs extra. And what I did, because I was traveling, I was using a credit card and I would get extra points. When my points reached enough to get a significant cash back, I used that cash to buy the lens when the lens was on discount during Christmas. Nice. So oh, nice. I waited, I waited, I waited. And, um, <clears throat> you know, Better me spending it on a piece of equipment than the credit card company collecting interest. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> can I uh, can I ask a little more about the um, the like camera tech side? Because I'm yeah. uh, so I I don't know if uh, we didn't really talk about this beforehand, but um, in our group, I'm kind of the the film and TV kind of person. I do the Twitch stuff and everything. So. Um, I was wondering, is your, you said that uh, that lens was um, a higher quality lens. Do you, are your lenses just like, I don't know if your camera is like a Canon or a Sony or something, but are they just yeah. like regular lenses or do you get certain? So I have a variety. So here's a regular uh, Canon. This is a T5i. It's one of the EOS um, Rebel cameras. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, these would be the popular level stuff you just get in Sam's Club on discount or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great camera. Um, a standard lens that comes with it would be one of these, which is one of the zoom lenses. Um, and usually the lenses that come with the camera are not particularly high quality, uh, but they are good. Uh, the thing to do is most of them are automatic focus, and you don't want to use that for astrophotography. You want to go under manual focus, um, and a because the, the thing you'll find with your first pictures is they'll be out of focus. I mean, they just will be. Mm -hmm. And focusing is a very, very critical thing. So the thing to do is make that manual. Uh, you can <clears throat> start your camera, um, start your camera up. I thought I put a battery in there so I could show you, but never mind. I must have <laughs> not put a battery in. Um, <laughs> that happens too out in the field, by the way. I see now. It really does. <laughs> you get out on a photo shoot and you oh. didn't bring the battery pack. Yep. Um, it's it's. There are so many things to go wrong. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you do that. You set it on manual. Uh, there's a zoom function on the live view. Uh, zoom into a bright star and manually focus extremely carefully. And uh, if you get a, a cheap lens, what happens is you'll accidentally knock the focusing ring and it'll knock it out of focus just when you're taking your photos, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Always. But that's, that's, a standard, that's a standard lens. And I would encourage people, if you want to start out, uh, just start out on one of those uh, cameras. Now, this lens here and that one is a, a Rokinon SP lens. Oh, uh, the SP, I guess, for special. Um, it's a special price, too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, the idea of getting a lens like this is it's uh, very wide, so it's collecting a lot of light. Uh, the only thing matters in astronomy is how, how wide the lens is. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to collect a lot of light. And... Uh, there are a lot of other attributes as well. For example, uh, if people are familiar with the focal ratio, which I know, Vicky, you will be. Um, but if, if people are not, the focal ratio is just the ratio of the focal length divided by the aperture. So the wider the aperture, the smaller the number, right? So if this is, say, 100 and this is 50, your focal length is, your focal ratio is 2. So your aperture is or your focal length is twice the aperture. Mm -hmm. Now what you can do on a camera lens is uh, stop that down, which has a little um, little th uh, iris inside a lens that will uh, stop down the amount of light coming through. And you go, why would you do that? Well, the reason for doing that is, well, it does increase the focal ratio. So you may go from f2 to f4. So now you're only 25 millimeters instead of 50. But if you have a cheap lens, Cheap lenses are not very good quality at the edges. And so you'll find when you take a photograph at f2, wide open, all your stars are flared at the side mm -hmm. because the optical quality is not good. So if you stop it down to f4, um, you're getting four times less light. It's half, this is where some of the math comes in. <laughs> it's half the diameter, but four times less light, okay? Because it goes by the area, not the diameter. Uh, so it's four times less light, so you have to expose four times longer, which means you have to track, but the quality of the images along the outside is uh, edge of your picture is better. That was a lot of information just right there. <laughs> it was. Well, and I, I actually want to take that and connect it back to <clears throat> what we were talking about earlier. One of our <clears throat> viewers has a question that I also have, <clears throat> which is, it seems like at some level stacking changes everything. Yes. And, and, and so, you know, first of all, um, you know, how you know, I, as I'm familiar with some stacking software, um, does the deep sky stacker that you talked about, does it deal with, um, does it deal with streaking? So for example, will it try and line up the images itself automatically, or do you really need to still have your iPhone on a tracker in order to be able to stack things so they don't trail? Sure. That's a really good question, uh, Matthew. So uh, you ideally need either a tracker, or if you don't have a tracker, you take photographs that are short enough where the stars don't trail. And there's a rule for that, it's called the 500 rule. And if this is a uh, 100 millimeter lens, focal length, 
divide that focal length into 500. So that's five. That gives you how many seconds you can go before the stars start trailing. Oh. Got so it. if you remember that, five. So five seconds is not long. You're not going to be able to collect a lot of light. Um, you'll certainly photograph the constellations very easily with that. Um, what you can do is bump up the ISO number uh, from like 200 to 400 to 800. I typically shoot between 800 and 1600. If you're beginning out and you want to have fast uh, return on your <laughs> exposures, uh, go to ISO 3200. You can take a five second shot and you'll have a Milky Way. Um, but the key is the ISO 3200 is noisier. Right. So you just take 20 five second shots and then stack them and Deep Sky Stacker will stack that automatically for you. And when you go to Deep Sky Stacker, there are lots of bells and whistles underneath a lot of the, and it takes a while to learn that, um, but keep at it and you'll gradually improve. It's not something that you learn instantly and then it works. Uh, it's, a, it's a process. As I sometimes tell people, um, this is for enjoyment. <laughs> You're not enjoying it, go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but the time that you take, you know, putting into learning Deep Sky Stacker is, is something that has a goal, an end goal, which is getting a really beautiful result you can share with friends. So, um, so it's worth, worth the, <laughs> the fun and the trials and the tribulations of learning the software, right? It sounds like it. And I love that it's uh, web-based. And so, I mean, I think that's really fantastic. Um, so then... Um, stacking versus uh, exposure time, right? Mm -hmm. So at, where's the where's the trade-off there? So I could take with my iPhone, I don't have a lot of control over exposure length. Um, so you know, there you just you know take a hundred shots. Um, but at what point is it better to take a longer exposure versus to just take a ton of them? Like if I is it better to just is it always better to take a hundred shots than to take 52 second exposures like where's the yeah that's a really good question and, and that <laughs> it's i would say it's something you debate with yourself every night <laughs> <laughs> I do. so there's no right answer dang it and, and it well there is no right answer um the the key is to experiment so for example for a long 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 time my um my tracking so here's, uh, let me introduce this character first. So this is a, um, this is a sky tracker. Uh, it's actually called a sky tracker, which is awesome. Uh, it's by a company called iOptron. There's two other companies that also make a similar device. And this goes on a, tri a camera tripod. And it has a little uh, tilt thing here and a telescope to line up with the pole star. So you go in here, you, it has an iPhone app to tell you where the pole star should appear on the little thing. And mount your camera on there, and that thing will track uh, for hours, um, so long as you don't touch it. And it's one of those things that when you're fiddling with the camera, you have to recenter the pole star, otherwise it moves off. So it's a little Got bit it. finicky. <clears throat> so the question is, um, so how many, how long do you shoot and then how many? So I typically like to uh, do a minimum of nine exposures uh, to get a decent, what we call signal to noise. So mm -hmm. that would be nine times the signal of a single shot and only three times the noise because it's square root of nine, right? That's just how it works. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is exposure time. So the exposure time depends where you live, surprisingly. If you live um, like where Vicky is in LA, uh, if you expose for a minute on any sky from LA, it's not gonna you go will well. have a white screen. Yeah. <laughs> because of all the street lights. The background sky is very bright. So you need to do short exposures in that environment. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the entire background sky is brighter than stars. Uh, where I live, I'm north of Wichita, Kansas. I can shoot, well, and I have a street light right outside my uh, house. 
and it illuminates my backyard where I do my photography. So even though I can see the Milky Way, I know that above my house, there's a block of air that is illuminated with white light. Mm -hmm. So I can go 30 seconds, and it starts fogging up. Got it. And so I would uh, sometimes go 30 seconds, maybe a minute. Now, what you can do, and this is where you start spending your, this is why you need a good job, right? This is why you go to college, you earn good money, <laughs> stop, so you can buy good toys, right? <laughs> right. Um, inside this camera, you'll see there's a little filter. Um, and you can also get a filter that will screw to the front of your lens. This is called a deep sky filter. So what okay. this does is it specifically filters out street light, background light, but it lets through the special wavelengths of light that most astronomical objects emit at, which is hydrogen in the red, oxygen in the green or blue, and um, a few other uh, isolated uh, spectrum lines, as we call them, uh, that gases in nebulosity emit. So it gets lots of reds and lots of blues and lots of greens. And it, so now I can go uh, four minutes with this camera. Oh, wow. previously I could only go 30 seconds. Wow. Now, wow. what four minutes does is that, um, <clears throat> for example, for a nebula like the Orion Nebula, the Orion Nebula is very bright in the middle, but very faint on the air, outside edge. So you can get a decent shot of the Orion Nebula in the middle of it in, say, 30 seconds. And that's great. But you will never pick up that very faint uh, outside wings of the nebula. Mm -hmm. unless you go to two, three, or four minutes. And if you're going to two, three, or four minutes, you need to be in a dark location and or use a deep sky filter to filter out the street lighting. So it's location, 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 <clears throat> always. <laughs> right. Uh, and then your ability to track and then how long you can track. Now, typically, as a rule of thumb, a lot of astronomical photographers they don't go longer than four or five minutes per shot. And you then start getting into the mechanical accuracy of your tracking mount. Because after four or five minutes, uh, if you're not dead aligned, you're going to start seeing some drifting. And then your stars will trail. So it's, it's not a single item that's the variable. You've got three or four variables, and you've got to balance them all. That's a change. And it seems like again one of the benefits of modern digital photography is that you can you can stack right like back when it was a single photographic plate or film or whatever right like you couldn't take oh let's do this plate for you know a minute and then another plate for a minute and then we'll just add them all together right like you had to get your shot on that plate because that was the yes. that was the physical recording medium yeah but now when you can take, you know, again, however you can fill your memory card with images, you yeah. can take as many pictures as you can and then add them up. Now, I assume that at some level you do need, you know, a good one second exposure as opposed to just, you know, the the quick whatever. What I don't even know a 60th of a second, you know, whatever, whatever the short yeah. shutter speeds are. Yeah, you, you need to capture starlight, um, you, you need uh, 15 to 30 seconds, generally. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier the five-second shot. That won't show very many stars. <clears throat> um, but if you take 100 of those, it'll show a lot of stars. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's where, uh, but it's still going to be a little bit of a noisy image because in five seconds, you can't, the camera won't record very much at night. Um, now, where you're at a plus is um, if the moon is out, because the moon will illuminate the foreground and remember it's sunlight. <clears throat> so uh, one of the clever, uh, let's say, nightscape photo photography you could do is in moonlight and take a not too long an exposure, maybe 10 or 15 seconds, and you get the stars and the foreground in natural color, like mm -hmm. it's daylight. So you have a daylight shot of your backyard, and there's stars in the sky. 
And that's really, that's amazing. Yeah. That's a very pretty, beautiful shot to do. Um, so yeah, that is amazing. And you're using and you're using. So I, remind me, like, what are what are sort of like a, a normal range of ISOs that like modern digital cameras can do? Is sixteen? You said you often shoot at sixteen hundred. Is yep. that is that pretty common that most cameras can reach well, that? Yeah, and in, in my reading, and um, you know, this this is this like any subject. Some sometimes people ask me, how, "How do you know all this stuff?" And they say, "I read, <laughs> <laughs> read a lot," um, and that's that's the key. You got to read a lot, uh, right. read a lot about. And that, nowadays, you can listen a lot to YouTube videos about how people are doing this. So there's an enormous uh, library of things in, on astronomical photography. Uh, that will help you with um, uh, skilled people who've who've gone down this road and can share their share their ideas, and you can um, uh, just develop uh, your own skill sets on that. Now, from what I've read in answer to your question, <laughs> is uh, typically the benefit between signal and noise is found um, between 800 and 1600 ISO. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's where the sweet, and that's different to if you grew up with film like I did, uh, you wanted the lowest ISO you could get. Yeah. And then that that's actually like I, I didn't do a lot of photography, but I was around enough of it that I had that kind of ingrained in my brain, and so that's why yeah. I find that's the switch to digital a little confusing. Yeah, it is it's confusing. Weird. Mm -hmm. And it's still mm -hmm. weird to me. I'm going, surely, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And the difference is, uh, well, part of the difference is the technology and the chip has improved. So you can get a camera, uh, let's say, like this camera up here, which is a, um, a Canon 6D Mark II, um, uh, which is a, <clears throat> a little more of an expensive camera than this one. It's about twice the cost. It has a better chip than this one mm -hmm. uh, and a better dark signal noisy stuff in the background. And uh, I'll come on to how you can get rid of that as well in, in some techniques. But uh, So the modern chips today are better and they're tuned um, where the... Now there are still photographers who will say, you know, if you're doing daylight photography um, they still say, you know, shoot one to 200 ISO. Uh, and yeah. I think that's reasonable in daylight photography. But at nighttime photography, there are different things coming into play. And one of the key things is your stacking ability. And that changes things. And the 800 to 1600 seems to give the best signal to noise where the noise can be suppressed. Yeah. Um, Got it. Yeah, I've heard of go to 3200, the noise is starting to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and what that does is, if you're familiar with, um, uh, now just blanked on the word that I mean, but it'll come to me, and Vicky, you might know, is, is, is the difference between um, the base level and the brightest object you can record, mm -hmm. um, that gap there uh, starts shrinking when you go up to 3200. So you can't get such a good range of brightness your range of brightness is limited to, uh, if you're familiar with bits in a computer, you can have an 8-bit picture, a 16-bit picture. A 8-bit picture has 256 levels of gray, and a 16-bit picture has 65,000 levels of gray. Mm -hmm. So clearly a 16-bit image will give you a much smoother graduation of um, pixels across an image, whereas a 8-bit picture might look a little bit choppy between brightness levels. As you go to higher ISO, you're getting closer to an 8-bit picture than a 16-bit. Uh, there's a lot of math that goes on in there, but yeah, that's... Yeah. that's yeah, I'm I've sure we can't of... answer everything in, in, in the stream, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah. I've, uh, I've actually heard of some cameras, We uh, and these are like some of the big uh, film cameras and stuff, I think, uh, like Alexa and uh, or Ari makes these and stuff, but some of them go up to like 128,000 ISO, and I'm like, why do you need that? <laughs> like, where are you shooting for this? Yeah, 
but yeah, um shooting on the dark side of the moon right? exactly yeah <laughs> Well, one of the neat things about this is that um, that there are digital cameras have now been out for so long that uh, you can find used digital cameras on like you know on on sites or in you know thrift stores or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can start getting some really reasonable prices on those those EOS you know. Yeah. T, yeah, the rebels are whatever great. cameras they're the rebels yeah and um and um, th that seems like it would be a really good intro camera fantastic intro camera yeah there, i still see people using the t3i yeah uh, t3i has been popular forever yeah yes um the t5i i think was the first one to come up with uh the flip land uh flip viewer mm -hmm. t3 i think it was fixed and this is beneficial if you have your camera pointing up at the sky on a tripod and you've got to do the contortionist <laughs> game, uh, and this will save your neck and your back and lots of other frustrations. So um, that's just one other thing to look out for. The other thing to look for as well for a camera is uh, a little photo release. Um, this is a device that plugs into a, a little socket in the side of the camera, and it allows you to shoot without touching the camera, and that's beneficial. Uh, these are a little bit pricey, they're like 50 bucks, so get one for Christmas, or um, there is a device, uh, a setting in the camera where it'll do a two or a 10 second delay from taking the shot after you've pressed the shutter. So if you don't have the cable release or the remote release, um, use the time delay in the camera and just press the button and then wait for the timer and then it'll take the picture without you touching it. That's the way around that. And that'll reduce like any shake, right? That's the intent. Yeah, you can avoid the shake and that's um, that gets us all. In fact, I took a beautiful shot last night, two nights ago, and um, I was taking four minute images of the Horsehead Nebula uh, in Orion and um, through a tel small telescope. And I took 10 shots and the tracker quit working after six. And so I have all of these beautiful jagged star trails. Oh, all them. No. oh my gosh. I saved one of them because it's a really good example of what can go wrong, mm -hmm. even, if, even if you're practiced and skilled at this stuff. The technology will get you. Yeah. When I can see that also like, you know, you know the the desire and sort of like the you can run away with equipment, you know. But just even the tripod you could spend, you know, money on too because that I mean, if that's your base for holding your camera, that's really yes. important for dampening vibrations and. Yes. So I I remember I have a camera a tripod here. I've got about five tripods, and three of them cost less than thirty dollars, and they're absolute. They're okay. <laughs> I was going to say absolutely useless. They're not absolutely <laughs> useless. <clears throat> um, but this tripod uh, costs three um, costs about ten times that, and it is rock solid. It is rock solid. So you re you do get what you pay for. Um, <clears throat> but also, and the other thing that happens, and this is, um, it took me a long, long time to learn this as a kid when I was only earning, you know, maybe ten. $10 a week or something, <laughs> is that spending $200 on a tripod is just not out there, right? You, right. you just can't justify it. But if you can justify it somehow, uh, this that kind of tripod will last you your lifetime. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you buy a cheap tripod, you'll be buying two or three more tripods in your life. Yeah. Right. And you may end up in the long term spending more money. but. Uh, it is a it, that's a juggling act as well as you know how much, <clears throat> and there's so many things in photography that uh, you know very quickly get expensive. Mm -hmm. One of the tricky things, and I'll mention this uh, when you're connecting a camera to a telescope, uh, there are seemingly unending pieces of adapters that you need, right? <laughs> right. And Every every adapter is between twenty and fifty bucks. Oh my gosh! And there was a time when I really didn't, you know, have uh, that kind of money to spend on 
even one item and I needed three, <clears throat> it's like, what do, you, what do you do? You know, that's, that's when uh, duct tape really is not the solution. Um, right. And you really need, do need the right device. Well, I like the idea of starting with a camera with a lens, mm -hmm. you know, and then doing if you if you start with that equipment, right, that like they're they're tightly coupled and, mm -hmm. you know, the camera body can presumably grow to, you know, attach to a telescope at some point And, you know, it seems like that could be a really good starting point for somebody. Yes. Yes, it's. I think it's a good starting point where you uh, you'll get decent enough pictures to encourage yourself along to to try and do better, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and you really can get excellent photographs. Now, some people, you know, if you do go the route of attaching a camera to a telescope, um, that's a high level kind of stuff to do because now you need a telescope mount that will track you know, a hundred times more accurately than this one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that <clears throat> could be a hundred times more expensive than this one. Uh, and, and you're getting into the higher engineering side of telescope mounts. Um, and, and that starts getting uh, tricky, but there are things you can do there as well. You can, um, do I, how much time do we have left? <laughs> as much as you um, like. <laughs> yeah, as much as we have. I mean, we've got, you know, 15. I'm drag my little telescope out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds absolutely fine. And then. Um, oh, also, really quick uh, shout out to um, we got a new subscriber, uh, FTI Ho Chu 23. Thank you so much for subscribing. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Just want to give a little shout out. Okay, this is, this is uh, hefty. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, this is an 80 millimeter. Telescopes are not very wide, but it is again extremely high optical quality. Got it. Which is the reason I got it. I actually got it for traveling to eclipses to take photographs of eclipses. So this came with me to Chile last year. Uh, last year. Oh, that's last year. Got it. And um, but the thing you'll notice is it has another telescope piggyback. So this is a 50 millimeter telescope. It has a little uh, digital camera on the end. So one thing you'll start doing is buying lots of little digital cameras. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what this does is this plugs in to the telescope mount. Okay. And there's a piece of free software called PHD2, which will take the image from this and uh, every two seconds, one second or whatever, it'll take a picture. And if a star in this telescope starts moving off, it'll tell the telescope drive to move it back. So it's Got the it. order guide tracker. Now it does need training, and there's a there's a, a wizard um, inside the um, inside the software that you just click it and it starts learning and it characterizes the mount that you have and stuff like that so this is the higher level stuff um, but although you do need a higher quality mount it does not need to be perfect and if, um, and you can have this order guider on the back and it will start uh, correcting any errors that your mount has within a certain amount you know uh, yes. <clears throat> If your mount is really flimsy and cheap, it won't help. Right. Um, but that's uh, kind of the direction. And that's what I attach this um, EOS Rebel to. OK. So uh, So I'm, we have kind of two more. So we have a question from a viewer. And then I want to we kind of pivot to uh, a, a, one, one specific topic that we wanted to talk about. Um, so Alexandra. Uh, would like to just uh, kind of reiterate. Um, so, did you, did she understand it right um, that uh, just setting manual focus to infinity isn't good enough, and that you have to focus more accurately on some specific stellar object? Very good question, Alexandra, and that's that's absolutely true. The uh, the infinity mark on your lens is not correct for stars. Stars are your ultimate test of a lens. 
And um, uh, yeah, my the infinity marks, even on my top quality lenses, uh, are nowhere near the correct focus. Mm -hmm. So don't mm -hmm. trust it. You have to you have to visually manually focus on the stars. Got it. And then a zoom lens. Um, you can zoom in, and those should be, is it, what's the correct term, parfocal? So like, you know, if you zoom in and uh, then you focus and then you zoom out, is that? Don't trust it. Don't trust no, it. It won't stay in focus. <laughs> don't trust it. Yeah, yeah it's not, not, accurate. It, not accurate enough. That's it. Yeah, but that's why that's um, it's super useful to use that little, um, like Martin was saying before, there's a digital zoom. Um, oh, okay. Cause that's, you, a, that, that's what he was talking about before. So yeah. you use the in-camera zoom. Yeah. yeah. So there's a on most I of them, see. it's like ten times digital zoom or something. They taught us in film school um, to focus on someone's ear uh, yes. when you're getting someone in the shot to make sure you're, they're perfectly in focus. You like super zoom into their ear. But yeah, it works the same with uh, with stars. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Well, I'll have to look for that function. Yeah. Very, cool. very um, important step to do before you shoot yeah yeah so this has been a great introduction uh, let's talk specifically you've been doing a lot of photography um, uh, on the last close approach of mars yes. and i think that for me anyway planetary photography is something that is interesting and motivating and perhaps challenging <laughs> but in an uh, you know hopefully in an approachable way can you talk a little bit about some of the work that you've sure. done and then maybe walk us into getting started with uh you know, because you know, with, with planet, you're shooting planets. Yes. So this is almost worth a session on it. Right. Well, that's what I was going to say. We could talk to you every week for yeah. a year, <laughs> I think. And, and, you know, I've been imaging planets for quite a long time using uh, what we call a video capture. And um, I got nice results. I was fairly pleased with them. But when Mars was coming around, I was seeing... Uh, incredibly high quality images coming from colleagues of mine. We share stuff on Facebook, right, uh, a lot, with the same telescope that I have. And I have a large telescope in the backyard. It's a 14 inch, um, huge telescope uh, for, for an amateur to use. And, uh, and I couldn't figure out uh, why I wasn't getting those top, top quality results. And uh, there were two reasons, principally. One was uh, temperature control inside the observatory before it goes dark. Got it. Uh, because the kind of telescope I have, which is uh, like a, a schmidt cassegrain it's a Celestron or Mead type telescope. Um, that tube is enclosed and it gets to 100 degrees during the summer in, uh, inside my observatory when it's 90 degrees outside. And then it would get to 70 degrees at night. I'd open the telescope up and it would take two and a half, three hours for it to cool down. I so see. during those two and a half to three hours, I'm essentially looking through a telescope that is filled with air that is shimmering like crazy, and I could never mm -hmm. get the decent result. So uh, after much <clears throat> groaning about how much it was gonna cost, I installed an air conditioning unit in there. Uh, it literally changed my planetary imaging overnight. Wow. It literally, I could not believe the quality. Um, and the way I judged the quality was to look at a star. And a star in a telescope should have a little ring around it. It's called an airy disk, uh, which you'll know about. And um, so uh, it's a little concentric ring with a bright star in the center. I'd never really seen that through my telescope. The first night I used the air conditioning unit, I put a video camera on, pointed at, um, I think it was uh, Deneb which is high overhead, and boom, there's the airy disk. That's so cool. <laughs> I, oh, Martin, you should listen to your scientific background a little more here. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was having an argument with myself going, Martin, why did you wait four years to do this? Uh, <laughs> This is crazy. You could have done this years ago and got good results. So I kind of... Which is laugh. funny because that's... I remember that that being one of the first lessons that uh, that they learned at Mount Wilson yes. was that you have to, you know, air out the dome and yes. cool down the telescope before yes. you image because, yes. because of I, that. I, I like, didn't realize how much it mattered for small telescopes. I have read about this since I was a kid. That big <laughs> telescopes had to do that. And here I am with my own small telescope going, well, it can't be that big a deal, surely. <laughs> It'll be fine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's a big, big, big deal. And then the other one is color mating the telescope, um, which is something you have to do with one of these schmidt cassegrain telescopes quite a lot. And a telescope, uh, when you're imaging Mars um, or any planet, um, normally for a lot of photography, you'll color mate and you may be changing the little screws on the end of the telescope um, like a, a quarter of a turn. Uh, and you go, ah, that's, that's good enough. It's not good enough for planets. And so I would get an extremely high magnified image of a star, and I'd move that uh, correcting screw a sixteenth of a turn to get it exact. And I did, I don't know whether it's in that um, PowerPoint uh, slide that I'm sharing with you, Vicky, but let me just check my numbers here. Yeah, I don't have an example in that slide set, but uh, you could go to, uh, for example, slide number, yeah, oh, let's go to the last one, slide oh, 26. Slide if you can share slide 26, by doing this very fine tweaking, um, I was getting images like uh, hopefully you'll see in a second. Yeah, they're up on uh, the screen now. That's great. And uh, the best image is through the infrared. So I have an infrared, fil I have a filter wheel that images in black and white, red, green, and blue, as you see on the screen. And then the infrared image is uh, both piercing our atmosphere and piercing through the atmosphere of Mars and seeing the surface detail. And I have never before got this kind of surface detail on Mars. And it's a combination of a very, very fine collimation of the telescope and um, exquisite <clears throat> detail just um, pops out. Now, having said that, that I live in Kansas. We're one of the windiest states. Actually, if you go to 23, Vicky, you'll see my rig. You'll see the setup. Oh, that's so cool. So that's the telescope with all the gear on the back. And uh, here's the little, uh, you can see the little red uh, video camera on the end. The black larger disc in front of that is the filter wheel. And then in front of that is a robotic focuser. So for each filter wheel, I have to have a slightly different focal point, which is something like 20 microns different to another filter. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, wow. And so <laughs> when I switch, I used to have a manual filter that I would change, and every time I touched the telescope, Mars would leave the field of view, and it was just... <laughs> okay. So um, imaging planets is, is an art form in both the technology side and it, it takes uh, a lot of development to, to get it right. Now you can start fairly simply. The nice thing is the software is free. And this is incredibly powerful software. So what you do, the principles of this um, is you have a video camera that can capture uh, you know, 100, 150, 200 frames a second. The Earth's atmosphere is shimmering above you, so the image of uh, Mars or Jupiter is doing a little dance in front of you because of all the shimmering of the atmosphere. And those 150 frames a second freeze every frame so that you sometimes get a clear image. Then the software will uh, absorb all of those frames. It'll filter out uh, all of the bad frames that are fuzzy, and it'll keep maybe the top 10% and it'll stack that 10%. And anything that is a constant signal, it'll reinforce itself. And anything that's random will get filtered out. Uh, oh, it's a very amazing. special filter. Uh, you guys, anybody who's been a university uh, and done mathematics will be familiar with Fourier transforms, uh, where you can split an image into frequency. And noise is a high frequency thing. And so you just cut that off the end and you keep the low frequency stuff, which is the stuff in the picture, and then reconstitute the image from that. And that's the, but you don't have to know that because the software does it for you. Right. Yeah. Um, and the software is called uh, Auto Stackert. Uh, it's uh, auto and then S T A K K E R T. Um, and it's phenomenal, phenomenally powerful software that is free. So that will filter your images. And then there's another software called Registax, uh, which has this special filter on it. It's called um, a wavelet filter, which is 
clever name for doing this um, uh, filtering of the, the noise, and that will sharpen the image for you. And, you know, to somebody who tried photographing their planets on film, <laughs> um, in fact, I think that, again, Vicky, I think my PowerPoint might have an example. I'll share these, um, <clears throat> I'll share these websites that you're talking about in our chat. Right. And, and so everybody can find those. Go to image 15, Vicky. 15? All right. These are famous images taken in 1956 from both Flagstaff and South Africa. Uh, Flagstaff <laughs> had the Lowell 24 inch refractor, which is still there. And South Africa had um, a, uh, a similarly sized telescope. And um, again, I can do a whole talk on Mars, but. Um, if you go down two more pictures, number 17 shows uh, a guy called Earl Slifer with his camera taking still pictures of Mars. So hopefully you can all see that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's very cool. You see, you see the number two on that camera? Mm -hmm. So bear that in mind. If you go down to, well, go to the next picture. Um, this is me photographing through an a 13-inch refractor in South Africa. This is my trip in 2018 uh, right. when I went down. And this is the first time a video camera had been attached to this very old telescope. Um, this is at the Boyden Observatory. Uh, it used to be the Harvard College Observatory, uh, Boyden Station. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go to the next picture, number 19, you'll see my image through that telescope and the very first images of Mars taken in 1888 with the same telescope. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. And those, those little black dots in the middle is Mars in 1888. This is a Harvard College Observatory plate taken on June 16th, 1888. And in, I'm in 2018, July 8th. Uh, there was a dust storm on Mars, so it obliterated all the fine features that I was <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well. And then if you go to the next slide, um, well, yeah, next slide is just one of my own photographs taken from home. By the time I got home in August, Mars had cleared out, and I was getting better pictures of my telescope than in mm -hmm. South Africa. But that's just the irony of right, of course. But the next next uh, picture shows me in Flagstaff using the 24 inch, um, in at Lowell, uh, and I also put a digital camera on the end of that telescope. That was fun. I I had 15 minutes before a public mm -hmm. viewing night. <laughs> That's awesome. Really? Yes. Yeah, I was going to I was going to ask how do you uh how do you get access to these big telescopes? <laughs> I mean, I so, guess you it helps to know somebody. Yeah. Yeah, so so the um the Bloemfontein one in South Africa uh with SkyScan we'd installed the planetarium in Bloemfontein. I knew the people very well. Um and we'd become very good friends and I was writing my column for Astronomy Magazine uh, back in 2017 about the great 2018 perihelic opposition of Mars. It's an opposition of Mars that occurs every 20 years or so that is closer than all the others. Mm -hmm. And I knew in my head, I thought, ah, if only I could, if only I knew somebody in the Southern Hemisphere, I would love to do that. And I thought, wait a minute, I do know somebody in the Southern Hemisphere. So I emailed my co uh, colleague in uh, South Africa and uh, within an hour he, I said could I come down and use the 13 inch and he emailed back within an hour saying sure come on down I went oh my gosh that was easy <laughs> oh man I was very lucky uh, and the Lowell Observatory I was actually uh, at an AAVSO meeting in Flagstaff mm -hmm. so we were there for like three or four days and I'd gone out the week earlier to do some photography at the Grand Canyon, wide field photography using that lens that I showed you, mm -hmm. uh, of the canyon in moonlight. So there's a, I was referring to taking photographs in moonlight. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I have, photographs. I have photographs of the red rocks of the canyon and, and uh, the stars above it. Uh, it's amazing. So I, cool. I chatted to them about, was there any chance I could connect my video camera to the big scope? and they said, well, <laughs> uh, 
we have public viewing nights. It's going to be tricky. And I said, can I do it in twilight? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it literally was, you know, 10, 10 15 minutes playtime uh, before they opened the doors. That's awesome. Was, they were very, very gracious. They're a wonderful, wonderful institution. Um, can't say enough about Lowell. That's, uh, yeah, great... they're fantastic. We have, we have, I have, I think uh, we have lots of friends up there. In fact, one of our former students is yep. working there. So uh, one of the people who was who was on our team is one of the educators right. up there now. Martin, right. Vicky's going to ask you a couple more questions, then we'll wrap up. I have to go get my son onto class, but I will be right back. Okay. Um. Yeah. So I just had a couple more questions because yeah. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time, but uh, I was wondering, we talked a little bit about um, some of the, like, the upcoming, uh, you know, events that, that you want to photograph. Is there any, like, dream event that, that like, uh, you know, some of those really rare ones? Because you've already done the, like, solar eclipses and stuff like that. Um, you know, solar eclipses are, I think, personally, for me, the ultimate challenge, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I got that small telescope that I could haul onto an aircraft. Um, it is heavy. Uh, it's 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 a pain to drag around halfway across the world. But when you're on site and that eclipse is sitting in your camera view and it's in focus, oh, it's worth all <laughs> all the the troubles of trying to get there. Um, I was due to be in Chile now oh, really? uh, because there's an eclipse on Tuesday oh. or is it Monday uh, total eclipse of the sun across Chile uh, for the second time in um, uh, in a couple of years mm -hmm. uh, which is rare for one country to have two, ecl two total eclipses um, the next total eclipse is in Antarctica and um, I may get to go but I don't think I'll be dragging a telescope with me that, <laughs> I don't know whether I'll be on a ship or an aircraft um, nice. That's really we'll be cool. leading leading a, a tour there, and then after that, of course, it's the United States gets mm -hmm. the next pick, twenty twenty four. So, you know, folks listening to this stream, you got four year, well, three and a half years to practice, and um, I'll tell you, start practicing now because it will not be enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if that's your first eclipse, start practicing now. The moon is very good target to practice on because it's the same size and about the same brightness as the corona. And so if you can start getting really good shots of the moon, and it'll be surprising, you think, oh, I'll use my telephoto lens on the moon. And you get this tiny, tiny, tiny little dot. <laughs> and you go, oh, I'm going to need a bigger telescope. Right. <laughs> then the trouble starts, right? <laughs> because you've got to get really good at using all that stuff. Uh, in the dark, under pressure, um, you've got to be able to use all your equipment automatically without thinking, and that takes practice, 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 practice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I practiced for the 2017 eclipse uh, for probably about three months um, by simulating a two-minute eclipse and going through all of my images that I wanted to take. Mm -hmm. um, and nowadays, there's software that will do it for you by... I'm still old enough school that I like to actually take each shot myself. You want to touch the, yeah. <laughs> touch the button. <laughs> I, I didn't trust the software, <laughs> although people who do. So that's, that's really, um, I'd say, you know, uh, one of the ultimates. I think the other thing, I sometimes ask myself, why do I keep going outside photographing the same objects? And because uh, I do. I was just out the other night photographing the Andromeda Galaxy. Mm. And, I oh, I didn't mention this earlier, but uh, this is a good one for you, uh, Matthew, and people listening. Uh, for many years, I would try and shoot as many objects in one night. Mm -hmm. So I go, oh, I'll get there. two or three minutes of that one and two or three minutes of that one. And you get nice, you know, postcard images. Um, Postcards, Facebook images, <laughs> uh, you know, little snapshots. But the real um, 
high quality images come from people who spend more than one night on one object. Got it. So you might spend four or five nights photographing the Andromeda galaxy at different intensities and you know getting the whole range of brightness, and then you uh, have maybe 50, 50 or sixty images to stack and put through Photoshop, and then it's learning the skill set of that workflow in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And I'm still climbing that ladder. Indeed. Sometimes get very good results, and sometimes I don't get good results. Um, my image of the Andromeda Galaxy, which I don't think I can show you, or maybe I, well, yeah, I can't show you, because I've unplugged that other computer. Um, but there's very few blue stars in it. And it was taken with this camera with the filter on it. Huh. Well, this filter cuts out the blue light, because that's in Oh, of course. Gotcha. <laughs> Red. So what I have to do is take a shot without that filter on another night, and then blend them together to bring that through. And that's 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 tricky. Yeah. Well, and that's part of the artistry of it. We did, we we won't have time for it today, but um, uh, yeah. you know the the post processing I know is is a whole skill set. So just getting the images is is only part of the skill set to creating those yes. final pictures. And that's where the Astro Backyard YouTube, uh, Trevor Jones, he does a very good job of explaining Photoshop as well. Excellent. Uh, there are other pieces of software, things like PixInsight. Um, you know, that's you, you're getting up into you know lots of expense in in software as well there, mm -hmm. but um, it's also very powerful. Yeah. But yeah. the key, I'd say, the number one key thing in astrophotography is getting a strong enough signal uh, to beat down the noise in at nighttime photography. That's that's the key. Mm -hmm. Got it. Well, and I think the other, the, the one of one of, I mean there were lots of takeaways, but I think one of the big takeaways for me was I think I underestimated how many exposures I would need. I was thinking, you know, a couple. But when we're when you're talking about 10 or 20 or 30 exposures or even 100 exposures, that's a scale that I just didn't, it didn't even occur to me. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think that's, you know, like you and I, we come from the film school, right? And, and it's, uh, it, it's the, um, what it's giving you is uh, you're defeating, well, you're, you're using statistics to get a better image. That's right. Precise. So every single pixel that you have in your camera uh, has a certain uncertainty uncertainty of measuring a value. And the more you can stack that up for each pixel, the better your quality of picture will be. Got it. Assuming your tracking is good and your lens is behaving and you remember <laughs> the battery in your camera and the camera card and, yeah. uh, and then you'll find out you're getting beautiful photographs and they start going dim and foggy because the dew at night has fogged over your camera lens. That's enough. <laughs> Just a million things that could go wrong, you know. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up for today. Martin, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah. It was wonderful catching up with you. And I, I don't think we've had a chance to talk about astrophotography. We've talked about a lot of planetarium-related things, but this was fantastic. And I really, really appreciate your expertise and your time. Well, thank you, Matthew and Vicky, for inviting me on. And all the wonderful listeners, I, I hope you've enjoyed it. Some of the questions have been fantastic. And uh, yeah, it's been a great thrill to spend part of the day with you. Excellent. Well, hopefully we can have you back down the line and uh, you have a great, uh, great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Bye, everybody. Uh, just really quick, uh, just wanted to let the listeners know, uh, next week we have our regular schedule of uh, Book Talk Wednesday, uh, Astronomy News, um, Book Talk Monday, Astronomy News Wednesday. And um, I think we are going to be skipping amateur astronomy until after the holidays. Uh, but we will let you guys know. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Have a good one. Take care.